Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another live session. As always, thank you so much for being here. Um, I should have checked the number on live sessions, but again, as we approach and get to 156 lives, uh, I want to do something special. I just look at 156 lives as achieving this milestone or goal of going live every week for three years. I don't know why that 156 number is stuck in my head, but it is. So um, so something just to be thinking about and something that we can uh, discuss as we get there, but some sort of giveaway or something. And I, again, I think that the 156 lives, I think we're probably only like two or three weeks away from that. So as we get closer, I'll kind of continue to prompt on that. Because again, I, in my mind, three years of going live is absolutely a milestone. Um, so you'll see below uh, the code dream job. Um, if you use that code today, 20% off the AI tool or course that's just available till 1159 Pacific time today. Um, okay, as we're coming in here, as always, just let me know that you can see and hear me and we have some comments already coming in, but where you're visiting from and remember the what is your dream job? That's kind of our downtime topic of the live session today. So if we ever get slow, we'll absolutely talk about what is a dream job and just some things to be thinking about when thinking about your dream job. Um, if you haven't had the chance to check out yesterday's video, it's about like how to face a challenge or how you would face a problem that really you didn't anticipate. And surprisingly, I Googled that question and it had 4 billion hits. And when I saw 4 billion hits, um, I always go to incognito to just get a, you know, kind of that non-biased perspective of numbers and, and 4 billion hits just shocked me. So definitely check out that video. I tried to keep the answer a little bit leaner than my typical hypothetical answers. But if you haven't had a chance to check that out, check that out. Um, so as long as, uh, I don't know where my brain's going today, but let's, uh, let's prompt on a couple services and then, and then we'll dive in. Um, you know, as I always mentioned, these sessions have gotten slower over the last couple of years as the job market has slowed, but I am here to answer any and all questions. They do not have to stay on the topic of dream job. Um, anything that's on your mind, I'm here to help with. And even if that's comments, items you want to personally share, that's great as well. I'll share a lot of my personal stuff in these lives too. If, you, if you've ever been here, you probably know I do that quite a bit. So quick prompt of my services and then let's dive in. Uh, if this is your first time here, my name is Jeff H. Sype. My business is practiceinterviews.com. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So that's strategy sessions like resume and LinkedIn stuff to one-on-one -on -one practice interviews and one-on-one -on -one negotiation. Of course, we have that interview mastery course and that's the 20% off today. You can find all that at practiceinterviews.com. The AI app, we're still working, building. We're really trying to improve the onboarding uh, component right now and then we're going to start to add some capabilities to add your own questions, bring in more common questions. But the more we look at the competition and, and what we've built so far, we know we have a best global in product, in market product, um, just in terms of the feedback you're going to get with that tool. So definitely check that out. Now, I have the code for 20% off of that AI tool, but try three questions for free. Um, see if you like it. See if you like the feedback it's giving you. I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every single Tuesday and new original content every single Monday and an occasional sprinkle in uh, of a YouTube short, but you'll see I don't do those that much. Okay, let's uh, let's dive in again. Where you're visiting from, you can see and hear me clearly. You're having a great day, anything. Uh, and thank you for being here. Hey, Jeff, a current contractor at Google inform me that Google is converting all their contractors to vendors. Have you heard anything about this? Um, and if so, what are the implications? Okay, um, you definitely have not heard about this. So I can check with my people and see what's going on there. Um, the implications of a contractor to vendor, it kind of bucketed everything for forever, right? It's been temporary, contractor, 
and vendor. That's the or vendor and contractor. That's the TVC terminology. Um, whatever they're doing, let's let's call it what it is, right? It, it's probably financially beneficial to them. It probably helps them, not probably the individual. Um, the vendor versus contractor relationship. Some of that can be about. Um, some of that can be about set periods of time. So like a lot of contractors, it's a one year contract or it's a two year contract. Whereas a vendor, uh, usually there's not criteria on a contractor length. So that might allow them to just keep contractors for longer periods of time. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Let's check out the second second comment of yours. Would this help to explain the drought of new contract roles. You were submitted to two different vendor roles recently and both were put on hold. What's going on over there? I don't know. Yeah, um, I can check into it though. Um, and if you want to follow up via Slack, maybe uh, that's fine. And again, for anybody who's here, uh, we have a free Slack channel. We're now at over 4,000 members. And so um, it's not super busy at this time, not as busy as it was a couple of years ago, but it's a great way to get answers potentially practice with your peers, et cetera. So um, let me look into that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, again, my pulse with what's going on over there will um, continue to remain the same, meaning um, I encourage people to get hired at Google uh, because great brand and great comp. Like great brand and great comp are they're going to play well in the long term of our careers, and that brand is absolutely super valuable. Do I agree with all the things they do over there? Of course not. Um, so, um, and I'm not. I think I'm probably past the point of trying to encourage anybody over there to try to change processes, do things differently, which I I did quite a bit of early on after I left, but uh, I don't do that anymore. Um, so I don't know that that helped at all, but, um, let me see if I can get some answers. Are you, are your one-to-one -one sessions with yourself? Oh, okay. Want to book time to discuss resume LinkedIn and potential career options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all the coaching is done by me. I used to have other coaches on the platform, but, um, that was a couple of years ago, and now it's just back to me. So uh, practiceinterviews.com, just go to the coaching page, and I'm definitely doing strategy sessions. Um, and the major reason was is there was a big, big push for strategy uh, over the last year. People really started requesting it more and more, and so I wanted to offer a more formal package. Usually we go through the resume. Definitely go through the LinkedIn because the LinkedIn is your low hanging fruit, right? Like for anybody, LinkedIn is just an amazing way to get found and then networking if we have the time. Absolutely. Practiceinterviews.com. I think my dream job is anything in an industry where I enjoy and I'm a cultural fit for. Of course, high paying would be nice too. Yeah. And I think that's such an important, um, that's such an important point. So like industry, is important. I think cultural fit is important. We want to make money. And so, you know, when we ask, what is your dream job? One of the pokes is, well, I hear a lot of people saying, Google's my dream job. But I think the, the question is why? And if I were to give the answer to that question, I think the, the real answer for why a company like a Google or a Meta or an Apple or an Amazon is, it's really the value of the brand, because the brand will pay you for the rest of your career. And that's why it's more of like a dream career opportunity than a dream job per se. But um, I don't, I'm not here to knock anybody's dream job, but do we actually think that that exists? Is there such a thing as a dream job um, for anybody? Cause for any, for any job. And even when we see, you know, an actor who makes, $20 million for a film or like NBA players because their salaries are just crazy. They make $50 million a year to play basketball. It's like, well, there's still the grind of getting up every day, the practices, the pain, all those other things. So it's just always a, it's always an interesting question that we'll discuss in today's session. Hey, 
Hey, Jeff, hope you remember me. I have my Google interview for a digital marketing strategist tomorrow. Any last minute suggestions for me? Have watched all your videos thrice already. And when he, time anybody says all my videos, I, I don't know how I feel about that because some of the old videos are, well, they're, they're old and I, I think I've, I've learned quite a bit since I started those videos, but um, digital marketing strategist, I mean, you know, you really want to be thinking about, okay, of course, your great examples of times you've delivered on process and strategy and collaboration, but on the hypothetical side, do you have some foundational digital marketing ideas that you could pre-build as assumptions? So I would just say really clean up that cheat sheet as much as you can today. Make sure that cheat sheet is clean for your clarifying questions, your frameworks, your go-to assumptions, and then the titles of your best behavioral examples. In a video interview world, we really have to utilize that cheat sheet as much as possible. So something I just strongly recommend. I would get that right today. If you obviously have the time to practice with a family member or a friend, um, really make sure you get your setup good, like whether you want to have a background like me where it's not blurred or you want to have a blurred background, you want to make sure your Wi-Fi is working great. Lighting. Lighting's a really big underutilized item in the interview. So what do I always do? I have a huge window um, in front of me. And so the light is coming in on my face always. And so whether I'm in my office office or I'm in my home office, I always sit with the light at the window coming right towards my face because that way it's going to give the best brightness. And the biggest reason why is, is eyes. You can see my eyes. So when you see my eyes, there's connectivity there. And like a lot of a lot of the bad lighting is like pocket lighting that we see in ceilings or just really heavy shadows. Actually having a shadow to one side or another just a little bit is fine. But I, I do focus a lot on lighting. And then the last piece, and I know I'm getting way into the depths here, but if you are glasses, make sure that you really practice that setup because the glare of the light off your glasses, it can make it impossible to see your eyes. And if I can't see your eyes, I'm, I'm not going to connect with you as strongly. Uh, I hope that helps, but there's always a ton of last minute prep. The other last minute thing to remember is, you know, 30 minutes before that interview, breathe, get to that meditative state. Don't prep, prep, prep up until the last second. You're using brain capacity. Prep up until 30 minutes before. Take a 30 minute break, use the bathroom, get yourself collected, et cetera, but don't prep and then go into it and be ready. Good luck. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, off to a good week so far, I think. <laughs> it's it's Tuesday, but the the joke for me and and the joke for all entrepreneurs is there really is no day, right? Uh, I don't really look at the week from Monday to Friday and then the weekends. I typically work on the weekends, but I have a more flexible schedule during the week, which I still tend to work. But um, yeah, it's just funny because because I don't really the days don't really matter. I, the work always needs to get done. So I got to do it. Uh, practice interviews .com. Yeah, if you scroll to the bottom, uh, you'll see an opportunity to join our Slack community. And again, that that is free. From what I understand in a background check, all that is verified is the job title, tenure, and reason for leaving. Really, you can put anything in the job description part of the CV. Um, actually, so it's even less than that. Well, and again, this is this is US based. Um, so in a background check, they can verify job title and tenure, but not reason for leaving. Uh, in the US, that's not uh higher right which is like one of the most the biggest like background check companies in the u.s they don't they don't check reason for leaving there's actually legality they're not allowed to um you can put anything in the job description part of the cv you can even change your title to be more aligned to the roles you're looking for it is just absolutely paramount and critical on a job application that we do two things correctly. 
you get the exact specific title in the job application and you have the exact perfect month and year. Those are the things that will cause flags. So I always tell the funny joke. Um, I had a job as a, I was basically a data analyst manager at a team of six. And <laughs> the title of the job was concierge support specialist. And like didn't align at all. I don't even really remember if that was the exact real title. It's been a while, but the role was to help basically executives build sales lists. And I had a team under me and, but concierge support specialist didn't mean anything to anybody. So I put data analyst manager right on my resume um, because that made more sense. But on the application, I put the real title. That was really long winded, but I, I hope it helps. But yeah, whatever you want to put for day to day responsibilities, you can. But obviously, you want to keep that piece honest because somebody might really dig into your resume and poke at those items. Hi, Jeff. I'm new to the channel. Do you have any resources for PGM interviews, questions and answers at Google? I have an interview coming up and would love any insight. Uh, if I've done, I, I've done a lot of videos, but program managers are a big one. Um, and that's kind of, that was my first actual YouTube hit. Wow, I'm really getting into storytelling today. But um, one of the pieces that I think is really valuable is, is you can search people's channels. So you could put like, go to YouTube and put in Jeff H. Sype and program manager. Yeah, and you'll find a ton. Um, you know, anytime it comes to program management. I'm thinking about the common things you want to think about. Obviously, you're going to have your behavioral answers. There's going to be lots of questions on keeping people on track, keeping things on budget, on time. I'm always thinking about goals, historical data, resources, risk, scope, scale, um, the critical stakeholders, timeline and budget, of course and building that shared vision. Those are some of the things I really think about with program management, but there's quite a bit of content on program managers on my channel. Um, I recruited them for three years at Google. Hey, Jim, how's it going? Thanks for being here. Hey, Jeff, I got an interview scheduled at Google Cloud for the position of customer engineer focused in on databases. I've never worked with GCP before. Any suggestions would be helpful before I attend. So most people going into CE roles at Google have not worked with GCP, period. So it's good. So you're probably going into this interview because you have a foundational cloud knowledge, whether that's AWS or Azure or another cloud provider, you know something about cloud. You have a foundation in cloud. It is important to learn a little bit about GCP before the interviews. Here's why. You get a hypothetical question. Uh, a client is upset with how Google Cloud is being optimized. How might you help them? And so if you just go in and you give your answer and you say, you know, we'd look at solution A, solution B, if you say, you know, we'd really dive into utilization of Kubernetes or BigQuery or if you're bringing in uh, GCP specific terms and kind of backing it up just a tiny bit, that's going to be really, really helpful. Because remember, what's going to happen is, is your recruiter is going to say, look, you're good. You don't need to learn GCP. The challenge is, is that they're not thinking about the interviewer who uses GCP and is connected to GCP every single day. So bringing in those terms is helpful. And if you have AWS experience, for example, just go find a chart on Google that breaks down AWS versus Google technologies. And that can be just a great way to learn. But I would spend a little bit of time there. Um, it's going to be valuable when you get to the interviews. I hope that helps. I'm applying for roles that I'm slightly underqualified for, or don't meet all the requirements. How do you think it's best to approach? Um, I always, always recommend that we don't have a hundred percent of the qualifications or requirements or responsibilities. Why? If you do, I don't want to hire you. 
Um, you know all the you know all the facets of the job. You know how to do every aspect of the job, and you're going to get bored, um, and you're going to leave quickly. So I want to hire somebody who can foundationally do the job, but is going to need to learn some skills to do it effectively because that typically keeps employees more engaged. This is, of course, a personal opinion, but it's something that I look for. And I always recommend that when a, when going after jobs, whether you're applying or getting referred, that you stretch a little bit. Now, if it's a 100% stretch and you don't have any of those skills or requirements, um, that's something completely different. Okay. So um, just always kind of think of it. I like a I like an 80-20 or a 70-30 rule. As long as you got 80% or 70%, usually it's worth worth getting after. Slack link is not working. Okay. I'll check that out after um I'll check that out after the live. Uh, I had somebody sign up this morning and it seems to be working okay on my end. So um the Slack link is uh <laughs> It's been a challenge ever since I've used Slack. So uh, we'll all work to fix it. Um, if you want, um, we'll work to fix it. Let me see what I can do. Um, today I had my phone interview, waiting to see now if I pass to final round to work at Google. Awesome, Gabriel. Good luck. All I can say is um, after your phone interview, if you don't hear back in five business days, it's not concerning, it just means it's time for you to follow up with your recruiter and check in and always check in with graciousness and kindness. Okay, so what is the average salary of a labels relations manager at Apple US? Um, so uh, when I I'm always happy to give it my best shot when we talk about salaries for roles, but the market is critical. Um, the Atlanta market is going to pay vastly different from the Bay Area to other markets, right? So um, if you have a specific market, I can tell you right now, I have no, I can guess what a label relations manager does. Um, but I would need to kind of understand more about location and leveling to give a, a really good number for you. Jeff, I'm currently updating my resume based on your videos and using ChatGPT prior to booking a strategy session with you. However, it's getting very long by adding a new summary section in. Okay. Okay. Let's talk through this. Um, I have nearly 30 years of experience, thus it's three pages. How do you recommend I shorten it to two pages? Um, so with a longer career, uh, you're going to get so much advice. And I'm sure everybody is just really sick of the resume length question um, for 30 years uh, three pages is okay I mean it's just it's going to be really hard to get it under that um, I always make the recommendation that if any of the earlier positions can either be removed or condensed because they are older that's going to be beneficial and we're always just trying to make ourselves look younger right um, and so anything we can do to remove those early career years, remove the education dates, um, the summary uh, should not, the summary should not be making your resume super long. We're talking five to seven, five to seven bullets. None of those bullets should exceed one line. So we're really talking about at a max seven lines, then you got to build a space, you got to build the summary. So it does add some. Um, additional, it, it does take up some space, but the summary section still remains to be the most critical section. Got to always remember our audience. Our audience is lazy and we got to overcome that by creating really solid resume summaries. I really am very, I'm not rigid about a lot of things on the resume, but the summary section is something that I just know as a recruiter for 15 years, if you put boom, 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 boom at the top. And I know all those items align with the skills I'm looking for in the job. The likelihood that I email or call you is a million times more. So um, that's the section we wouldn't want to chop, but maybe earlier career stuff. Um, you absolutely could. I hope that helps. 
after two attempts, I finally landed a CE role at Google. Amazing. My gratitude to you and your entire community for the questions, invaluable advice, tips, and guidance to help me upbeat and get me through. Amazing. We will never, I hope that people never get sick of these comments because it it can feel so overwhelming. Um, just not just Google, but any interview can feel really overwhelming. And so um, when we do land the role, uh, it just feels amazing. And, and congrats. Uh, thanks so much for coming in and letting us know. For anybody else who's here, when you do land that job, come back and let us know. It gives us the warm and fuzzies. It makes us feel good. And and for me, it it helps me keep going, you know, because I was telling my wife yesterday, I mean, five and a half years on YouTube, it's, it's grindy, right? It's grindy to constantly um, come up with new content every single week. These lives, they're great. We just kind of come in, we get this good flow, but the original content is super, super grindy. So anytime anybody comes back and has gratitude, we appreciate it. So thank you so much and, and wish you the best of luck. Thanks for the earlier response. I've never attended any interviews with tier one companies. Is it possible to crack an interview at Google with 20 to 30 days of prep? 100%. And more time, I'm going to say it's not going to be like super beneficial in the sense that for most of us, if it's not right now, um, if it's not absolutely right this second, uh, you know, we're just going to procrastinate. We're going to push it off. It's not the easiest thing to prepare for. So the more condensed the timeline, the more it forces us to prepare. But yes, absolutely. I just think the biggest thing is how do you break up interview prep versus learning GCP? That's going to be the biggest thing you want to be thinking about. I'm quite early in my career, so I fit my resume on one page. Do you think it's worth having a summary? Always. So what are we talking about with the summary? It's related to the specific role that you're interviewing for. We, we create our shell or our go-to resume and we put whatever we want in that summary. But if you're applying for a job, you're going to throw your resume and the job description into ChatGPT or your preferred Gen AI tool. And you're going to say, create five resume summary bullets that align the job description with my resume. Boom, those are the five summary bullets. Throw them in there. And then that's the resume you apply with, get referred with, network in with, et cetera. Um, but I think that every single job we apply to should have a new resume. And anybody who's not willing to take that step, that means we're hitting the easy button. You'll just end up being one of these people on LinkedIn who says, I applied to a thousand jobs and I didn't get the role. Those a thousand applications aren't getting a new resume every time. That's really not hard work to just click easy apply to all these jobs or whatever's happening. So um, take the time to redo the summary for every single job. It's really three to five minutes. But yes, I recommend it even for more junior level candidates. Okay. Caffeinating and hydrating. All right. Is Google still prioritizing internal candidates? Even in the rare case that a role opens up with no caveats, my profile still get ends up getting passed over for another candidate. Yeah, so this is so interesting. Like actually in the past, Google didn't, when I was recruiting there, they didn't prioritize internal candidates, which actually drove me crazy. They were validated. I think internal candidates should always get the path. I know people aren't going to like that, but it's validated information. I can I know a lot more about somebody who's put in a hundred hundreds or thousands of hours of work as opposed to somebody who interviews for a few hours, right? Um, this the battle we're talking about um, with Google has just been a long time. Um, and again, I'm going to keep your name confidential. Obviously, I know your name, but I'm going to keep your name confidential uh, just in this live session. But I think we're you're maybe hitting the point where, like, just based on your overall experience, 
Um, it may be time to consider other companies. I don't think that Google's given you the best experience. Um, and no, absolutely, like internal candidates and transfers are being vetted. Everybody's being vetted. They're still hiring external candidates all the time. Um, but your path has been really, really challenging. Um, and being stuck in the team match for two years is frustrating. Look, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, has this company treated me the way I want to be treated? Is this really my dream job or dream company? If they're not going to treat me the way I want to be treated, the fact that you've been in team match for two years, like nobody should be in team match for two years. Nobody. It's absolutely absurd. Um, it's not fair. It's not right. And so it's just something that I want you to consider. Um, there's been a lot of frustration. So is, is Google still your dream job and dream company? Because maybe it's not. Maybe it's time to go after something else because I don't believe that they've treated you the way you should be treated. Okay. And that's not going to be everybody, but in your instance, that's how it feels. All right. We're at the thirties. I'm going to do just a very, very quick prompt on my services and then we'll get back to business. Just today, if you use the code DREAMJOB, 20% off of our AI tool, that's just app.practiceinterviews.com and 20% off our course at practiceinterviews.com if you go to the coaching and course page. I'm still doing one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions, that's resume and LinkedIn, one-on-one -on -one practice interviews and one-on-one -on -one negotiation sessions. Um, we are getting great feedback on the app and we're continuing to improve it. There is a significant development cost every month that I'm putting out to continue to improve the tool um, on a weekly basis. So uh, I think I think it's going well. We're getting some good feedback. If you like what I'm doing today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribed, I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every Tuesday and new original content every Monday. All right, let's get back to it. Okay. Hey, Jim. So summary pushes me basically to 2.5 pages. Yes. I just, uh, again, I, I want to say this in the nicest way, but, but it, it doesn't push you to two and a half pages. It benefits you and brings you to two and a half pages, right? Like we have to use the resume summary again. I, I like, I will, I just, I've spent way too much time in the recruiting space. We always do everything thinking about our audience and well, that's how I operate. So not just when it comes to resumes, but when it comes to networking or comp and especially the interviews, I'm always thinking about, well, who am I speaking to and, and what are their needs and what do they want? Right. And so, um, the summary piece is just going to be absolutely critical. Um, and I will, I'll continue to uh, hammer that home as much as I can. Yes, and congrats. Thanks for doubling down there. Um, you also want to book a resume strategy session, anything you recommend beforehand to make the most of it. Yeah, if anybody wants to book a strategy session, I would just say go to practiceinterviews.com, use the resume template there. Um, and just do as much editing of your resume, LinkedIn, how you're going about networking, because that will just allow us to get even more strategic in those sessions. Is it, is it in the GCA or RRK round? The system design questions are being asked. Um, you know, for customer engineers, um, if it's a more technical customer engineering role, then you'd get a, you'd probably get a system design question in the RRK round, but you always want to clarify with your recruiter, Hey, for this specific CE role, am I going to get any system design questions? Cause some have it and some don't. Okay. Uh, I'm applying for mainly entry level positions. Okay. Okay. Great. Sounds good. How early, how early is too early when wanting to resign? Um, 
This is a fantastic question. So no time is too early, in my opinion, to resign. Meaning if we get into a job and we're miserable, uh, I don't think that we should hang out or stick around now. Very easy for me to say. I don't understand. I don't know your financial situation, your family situation. Do you have kids? Do you have pets? Mortgage? You're taking care of elderly parents, whatever it may be. And so we absolutely want to be thinking about finances. But this is correlated with the, well, I'll just stay there for a year. I'll just stay there for two years. Setting that kind of criteria when we accept a job, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, so I just always like to be really kind of loose and fluid in terms of how long we stay. And I say we stay as long as we're happy. And what makes us happy at a job? Usually it's our manager. People don't leave companies. They leave managers. And that's why when anybody leaves any organization, if that organization does not do an exit interview, I don't care how big they are. They're doing a disservice to all the employees at that company by not doing an exit interview, because I can guarantee in those exit interviews, the vast majority of time is it's a bad manager and they didn't have any feedback that that manager was bad. And then the person leaves and then you lose the institutional knowledge, you learn, you lose all these other things. So, I mean, again, I, I like to speak to it. The fact that I never got an exit interview at Google um, still annoys me to this day. And, you know, I'm past it. We can only live in the present. We can't live in the past. But that's something that they absolutely should have done because I could have given some massive feedback about how bad my leadership experience was there. Um, but the fact that they didn't take the time to ask was I, I found that to be frustrating. So um, it's a great question. I would just say as long as you're happy, stay. If you're not happy, definitely leave. Thanks, Jeff, for all your thoughtful responses. One of my problems is that I'm in UX writing. Were I applying for CE or TPM roles, I'd probably have more luck due to the number of available roles. UXW roles come up once in a blue moon. True, true, but, but is this, like, if you were to reflect back, has this journey been worth it? Has it been worth it for the stress, the anxiety, the frustration? Um, that would just be my question. Now, you can just sit back and do little to nothing, check in check in once a month. Um, I know your, your point of contact there hasn't been great, so, but you can, you can always check in. Um, but I would, I would be going after other roles at other companies at this point, 100%. And yeah, um, we're going to see less and less writing roles because um, not that there's not nuanced items, but we're just going to see less of them too because of generative AI. What's your view of big tech versus Wall Street? I've been told that there is less job turbulence in Wall Street versus big tech, and it's as lucrative. Do you have any insights in this area? Um, wow. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know where you're reading that, but um, Wall Street is... I don't know. I would think, feel like that would be pretty turbulent. Maybe it's because it's finance. It's a little bit more secure. Not as lucrative. No way. Um, Wall Street, it depends on the role, of course. I mean, if you're doing trading, then of course, yeah, you can, the opportunities are endless. But in general, finance and banking, nobody globally, and again, this is just casting a really wide net, nobody globally pays better than tech. And it's really not even close. Um, it's an interesting take, though. Uh, tell us more if you like. Yes, thank you, Jim, for the positive vibes. Hey, Jeff, I had my interview with the hiring managers, and my feedback was sent to a hiring committee. Do you know how long it usually takes to hear back on a final decision? Google Data Center Tech. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, well, first things, congrats for going to hiring committee because that's a that's an achievement in itself. And people are like, whatever, I just want the job. So I get it. But um, 
I just, I'm a little confused at why at this stage there's confusion and this has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with your recruiter. When you get to the hiring committee stage, you should know the day, time, and hear back within the hour of going through hiring committee. So I would tell you, I would say, hey, look, you're going into hiring committee at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday. Uh, wherever you fall in the order of being reviewed in hiring committee, right after you've been reviewed, I'm going to leave the meeting and I'm going and I'm going to call you. And so that would mean it would happen at the latest at 11 a.m. or sooner, right? And so when recruiters don't provide 100% clarity on when HC is meeting and the fact that they're going to call you with the result. It's just a, it's just on the recruiter. It's an inexperienced recruiter. Um, so, but you can check in, but you should know the date you're going to hiring committee. And I, I think it's okay to just email them and say, Hey, I just wanted to double check. Can you tell me the day and time I'm going to hiring committee? And then when I can expect to hear back from you after that decision, because there should be no ambiguity at this stage in the process. I know individuals with really good managers and individuals and, and I know individuals with really good managers and individuals, however, the work and industry they were not a fit with and what they wanted to do quite common for new graduates. Yeah. If you have a great manager and you hate the work, you hate the work, right? Like it's got to have, it's got to have multiple pieces of alignment, but a great manager will support what you want to do. So a great manager might say, you know, you're really better at this. Have you considered going down that path? Maybe I could introduce you to another lead who could help you get into that role. So the default is great management. But yeah, for early graduates, <laughs> I mean, if I could remember that far back, which I barely can, but I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I tried lots of different things. Um, and I found that I liked talking to people. I was incredibly social, and that's why recruiting was just a good match for me. Um, but yeah, it, it will take some time. And I do believe that there's just intense pressure, especially in our 20s, to have it figured out. And from what I've seen, um, from people that are my friends who are older now, uh, most of the people who didn't have it figured out in their 20s are the ones that are happier now because they didn't get trapped into something so early. Now, of course, that's a case by case basis. But it, I mean, for me, I can tell you, it took me a long time to figure it out. And I would say it wasn't really until I was 40 that I had a clear vision of wanting to work for myself, be my own boss have all the control and just knowing that regardless of the finances, which are obviously important, but that being my own boss and, and never giving up that piece of control was going to be the most important item to me. That's not the most important item to everybody, but when I had a good day, I wanted to tap myself on the back. When I had a bad day, I don't know what I wanted to do, but, I, but everything ultimately uh, depended on me. And I, I like being in that position. That can be a lot of pressure or too much pressure for some people, but that's that's my preference. Okay. We are 43 minutes in. We still got a good audience. So um, I'm always going to kind of hang out, wait for additional questions. I see one just came in. But um, please, any questions, any comments, anything that's top of mind. And then if we do run out of questions, which we just did, and we'll talk a little bit more about the dream job. What is your dream job? How important is the communication for the Google CE role? Um, that's the most important item. Uh, communication skills are, there's nothing more important than a CE role than being a strong communicator. Sorry, I'm getting a crazy glare from this truck out here. I'm trying to fix this. Um, yeah, there's nothing more important than communication. So that's going to be paramount. That's going to be number one. So what does that look like? Well, in the interview, it shows up as being a little bit lower and slower, being thoughtful, taking your time, and then speaking to the importance of communication, whether that's collaboration, working with other stakeholders, cross-functional, internal or external, but communication is number one. And by the way, 
that is hands down the number one most important skill set of any job at any company across the world. And communication will get more and more and more important the more things get automated. The more AI impacts our lives, the more the only skill we can rely on is communication. And I don't know if I've shared this, but I'll share it now. My next career is all communications coaching. So that's the next iteration after the interview stuff. I want to really just focus specifically on communications. I learned through the interview process that this is the piece I enjoy the most, but with the impact of AI, nothing's going to be more important than that skill set. Grad schemes I know in tech, especially FTC, are, lack, are locked in, so couldn't really switch organizations. Uh, why? Why couldn't they switch? Uh, nobody is forcing anybody to do anything, right? So, yeah, some of the grad schemes get you into these rotational programs, whether that's one year or two years or up to three years. But if you're unhappy, you can leave. And if you get into one of these tech rotational grad programs, uh, you'll get you'll get views, you'll get interviews, and you'll just be able to say it was a great experience. I learned a ton. I don't believe that this is 100% aligned with what I'm looking to do over the next couple of years. And that's why I'm so excited to be talking about your role at your company. And we flip it over to them. But nobody is locked into any job. Now we can feel that pressure. And especially that pressure comes from a financial standpoint. Typically, we got to pay to eat and live and do all those things. But they when we say we, they couldn't really switch, they can always switch. It's it's always a choice. You're welcome. Absolutely. Okay. So again, we're out of comments. As any comments come in, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, typically, these live sessions, we're going anywhere from like an hour to an hour and 15, hour and 20. So anything that comes up, anything that's top of mind. Let's talk about what is your dream job now that we have a few minutes of downtime? Um, what is your dream job? And so what are the items we want to be thinking about when we think about our dream job? Well, we want to think about ease of things like just logistics. Do we want to be able to always work from home, have a really short commute? Do we really want to go into the office every day? Like logistics is really important. I also think for dream job, obviously, we're thinking about compensation. Compensation is a key one. Um, we're thinking about leadership. Leadership is another key item. And then, of course, the brand, right? I mean, what is the value of the brand? Do we care about that? Are we thinking about how we build our long-term career? Or that brand really isn't that important to us yet because we haven't we haven't gotten that deep into our career to say, okay, I really want to build off of this brand to get to the next step. These are just a few basic items to be thinking about. But again, I, I hear so often like Google is my dream job. And, and I always want to kind of just respond and say, well, well, why? Because everybody's saying that, that Google is this ideal dream company. But I mean, again, going back to it is is when I look at any of these big tech companies, I think it is a bit of a dream in terms of, again, that value of the brand and the overall comp. We'll dive in a little bit more in a second. Let's let's dive to this comment. Um, I have two years professional experience. How valuable is a degree really? Um, well, it's becoming less and less valuable. I mean, we can, anybody who wants to throw in the comments there, whether they agree or disagree with that statement, but the reality is, is that it really is, um, it really is becoming less and less valuable. Now, there's some foundational stuff that comes with a degree that is really valuable. How we learn social skills, communication skills, we have to interact, we have to work hard. There's lots of Proof in the pudding, um, proof in the pudding, yeah, um, for getting a degree. But I think the, the real question will be like, well, what about in five years? Is anybody really getting a degree anymore? Or 
are all is all the education around prompt engineering or automation or what what is that actually going to even look like but anybody who for example is saying hey i'm going to go get an mba i would say no especially like even let's take an elite program like a stanford's M mba program it's like two hundred and forty thousand dollars usd for two years that's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year what if you invested two hundred and forty thousand dollars into developing an ai product i think you'd make way more money learn way more be way more successful so like getting an advanced degree now when we talk about masters that are specialized for certain careers sure we talk about PhD level, of course, there's just a level of depth there, but your classic education and degree is becoming much less valuable. And I will hire people with years of experience over the degree 100% of the time now. And that's just kind of been the case for a while, but it's just going to be, it's going to be more and more in the upcoming years. So yeah, it, the degree is becoming less and less valuable, but I think there are some, there are just some smaller items that that aren't that small and again a big one is when we go to school we just have to learn better communication and social skills which will translate to us performing better on the job yeah there's a lot of people that just do agree because of parental pressure and they want it for status i don't think that the degree is a status item anymore um, if you look at all the richest people in the world, most of them don't have degrees. So I don't think that the degree is a status symbol. Now, of course, if you go to some of the elite schools across the world, yeah, there's a little bit of status there. Um, but for the vast majority of schools that are not well known by people, um, yeah, it's becoming it's becoming less and less of a status item. And in some cases, for what people want to do with their careers, it's not beneficial. It's actually just more debt than actually a status item. It's a good, it's a good topic, though. Speaking of brand, I'm looking at offers from Disney. Okay. And ServiceNow. I'm leaning Disney. Any thoughts on the tech brand value of their streaming org? Okay, Tim. Good question. Um, I think that Disney as an organization and overall, I like the brand just because it's so recognizable. People have all sorts of different thoughts about Disney, but Disney does really hire top talent. Um, you know, it's it's a very competitive organization and it's tough to get into. Um, so I think that it's not a bad choice. ServiceNow is a really good company. Um, they're not as well known, but they're pretty well known. I think it's a little more niche. It's obviously more niche down than Disney pretty much, at least in the US, everybody knows Disney, right? And I think it's a, it's got a very, very strong global brand as well. Um, so yeah, I think just pure brand Disney is going to probably be a little bit stronger, but service now um, in the tech industry like has a very, very solid brand. I would definitely kind of just way service now versus disney just from a position perspective first then what do you know about those hiring managers how how well do you know them how much have you spoken with them because if the manager is better at service now i would pick service now 100 percent of the time and then the last piece is comp how does the comp weigh out between the two companies and so those are kind of the three factors just job manager and comp those are kind of the big three. And then, you know, the last one, just really simple is always getting back to logistics. Like my commute to my office is 0.6 miles. That's right. 0.6. And I ride my bike <laughs> and it's a beach cruiser. So I ride my beach cruiser to the office and even walking, I save like three minutes by biking over walking. So for me, that logistical item is a huge, huge benefit and something else that we just want to consider logistics a little bit. It, it does contribute to happiness. Um, so I threw a lot at you. I hope that helps. But Disney's brand is probably a little stronger than ServiceNow. But if you niche down into ServiceNow's industry, maybe ServiceNow has a better brand. So something to consider. I do agree. 
But for initial days of the career to get an opportunity to work in big tech, a degree may help. Um, early career, yes. Probably a degree is going to help in early career. Um, later in your career, no. I hired a ton of people at Google who did not have degrees. They were they had good years of experience. They had been self-trained. But yeah, I would say maybe for earlier in your career, having a degree because it kind of replaces the work experience, right? It's, you, you do work hard for the four, four and a half, five years, however long it takes to get the degree. You do work hard for that. Um, so yeah, there's something to be said for it for early career, but the trends are going away from degrees. And over the next five years, we will see an absolute reduction in the number of people getting degrees. And I think if we were to cast a wide net and look 10 years out, it's probably going to be cutting at least half, um, if not more. Who knows what it's going to look like with AI? And, you know, AI is, is things are changing really quickly. I think that there's only and probably this community has a stronger pulse on it. But I I think the average person isn't really understanding how much this is going to impact their lives, but it, it's going to impact it quite a bit. And I think some of the bigger trends and transitions are going to happen really, really fast, like overnight transitions in the way that we just live our daily life. And even if you think about chat GPT, for example, I use chat GPT every single day. So it definitely has impacted my life on a daily basis already. Okay, again, we are at a question, so let's do this. Um, I'm still happy to kind of discuss this, what is your dream job? I went really cursory, really high level before. Uh, we can dive a little bit more into that subject, but let's do this. Um, well, let's do it. Okay, so dream, dream job. So I think there's also this correlation of dream job and manager. Uh, so if you've been on any of these lives, you know I've talked about this quite a bit, but if you have not read the book, The Nine Lies About Work, and specifically lie number six, people can accurately judge others. They can't. Everybody can only judge within their own lens, within their own lane. And that's why usually when we get a great manager, they're in within our same lens or lane. That's why we can do the same job for manager Bob and be terrible and manager Sue and be great. It's because each one of those people had a very different lens on what good looked like, but we stayed consistent in the same. And so in your dream job, if you're assessing trying to take a job at a company, make sure you speak to that manager and make sure that they're positive and you get a good vibe from them. If you get bad vibes from a manager, you're not walking into a dream job. Absolutely not. So that's kind of one of those untouched things. And then the other thing about a dream job is like, what is the future opportunity? It's not being talked about. It's like, it's nice to have the job now, but how does that fit? What's the piece of the puzzle for that dream job fitting into that ideal future state for you, growth, and be thinking about a dream job in terms of, well, what's going to change with AI? That dream job now could change significantly. So start thinking about jobs that maybe are less impacted by AI, and that will all come down to communication skills. If you fall into jobs that require massive amounts of communication, that's usually going to yield more success. Okay, we are out of questions, out of comments. If anything additional comes in, I'm happy to answer it. Let me just go into my wrap-up. And as I'm wrapping up, if anything else uh, comes up, uh, happy to answer it. So just until 11.59 Pacific time today, if you use the code DREAMJOB, that's 20% off of our AI tool at app.practiceinterviews.com or 20% off of our course. And that's just practiceinterviews.com on the coaching and course page. Still doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, strategy sessions, that's resume, LinkedIn, and networking, one-on-one -on -one practice interviews, and one-on-one -on -one negotiation sessions. Obviously, we have this course and a discount today. It's our interview mastery course. Definitely over 50 exercises that are going to help you improve your interview skills cannot come out of that without better interview skills, 100%. Um, I go live 9 a.m. Pacific time every single Tuesday and new original content every single Monday. 
Um, if you like what I did today, smash that like button. If you've never subscribe, subscribe, consider subscribing. I'll answer any last comments and then I'm going to bounce off. Um, well, we just got this last one from Jim. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Thanks, Jim, so much. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here. One last quick note. Um, I want to do something special when I hit 156 live sessions because as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't know if anybody's still here from the beginning, but as I mentioned in the beginning, um, 156 live sessions for me, it's three full years of going live. So I'm going to do some sort of giveaway or something fun. And I think that's like two or three weeks away. I'll definitely let uh, the audience know. I'm going to answer this last question and bounce off. I have plenty of experience in some tech and I want to change my career into other tech without having any industry experience just with having some certification. Okay. And that's possible. You can get certifications that will help. So like a Google cloud certification would be really valuable, right? So um, you can get certifications without having to get additional education. I would say licenses certifications are more valuable after you've gotten that degree than maybe again, going and getting a master's degree, for example. Take care, Jeff, and thanks for putting up with all my questions. Um, your scenario is super unique. Um, you're one of the very rare people who's been in the team match stage for two years. I just think sometimes I would just I, I would just encourage you to not put all your eggs in one basket, which I'm sure you're not doing. But I just I want you to start to question like, is this the experience I want to have, and is this the company I want to work for? Um, it's just. We all need to ask that question of ourselves, but um, you just your experience hasn't been good. And maybe when it's all said and done, you can leave some very, very good feedback for them because um, this journey has just been absolutely crazy for you. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Sincerely appreciate this community, and I will continue to show up for this community every single week. Um, as long as you show up, I'll show up. So thank you so much. Have a fantastic Tuesday and I'll be back next week. Take care.